Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session once again we are going to talk on photosynthesis. Dear friends, we believe that through our previous session on photosynthesis you have grabbed maximum knowledge and now you might be wondering and you might be curious to know more about photosynthesis. So friends, today we are going to talk on photosynthetic pigments and we are basically going to talk on the structure and uh, functions. Friends, for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Eklavya Chauhan. Dr. Eklavya Chauhan is formerly Associate Professor with Department of uh, uh, Botany, Dejbandhu College, University of Delhi. And uh, we would like to tell you all that uh, Dr. Eklavya Chauhan is a prolific professor throughout uh, his uh, teaching career. He has uh, uh, always tried to benefit the student community through the dint of uh, his knowledge and wisdom. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Eklavya Chauhan on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is one I repeat, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. You are just requested to call in the last ten minutes of the lecture. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Eklavya Chauhan, once again. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Oh, thank you very much, Geetika, uh, for the kind words. Uh, dear friends, uh, if you remember, we had uh, a very long discussion uh, at the beginning of our chapter on photosynthesis, which itself is a very colossal one, and we stressed on the development of the concept, how did the concept come into being and it took a few centuries to crystallize the idea as to what was the raw material, what was the kind of process and what were the byproducts and what was the basic aim of this process. Uh, before we go to today's uh, uh, subheading which is the structure and function of photosynthetic pigments. I would also like to add that although we mentioned that all flesh is grass was a concept which came from the ancient sages say about 300 to 350 BC but one should not forget that uh, in our own Indian scriptures, our old sages, even in the in the Upanishads and in the uh, different other scriptures like the Vedas, we have had a mention of plants, the essence of photosynthesis, if not in its definition form, but in the essence and of course the importance of plants thousands of years even before uh, the concept of all flesh is grass. In addition, it took about three centuries, as I said before, to come back to the idea of a general equation. And this particular equation was marred by a very uncanny uh, equivalence, if I may say so, between the number of carbon dioxide molecules and the number of oxygen molecules uh, which were released. And this gave us a very false uh, sense of well-being in the sense that everything was so good with the perfectly balanced equation. <clears throat> if we just recapitulate the correction which was needed in this equation, even though everything was perfectly empirically balanced, but then does this equation represent the true photosynthesis? Perhaps not. And as a result, if water is the source of oxygen, uh, it is a matter of common sense. How can six molecules of water uh, give rise to six molecules of oxygen? And therefore, we again gave all the weight on the shoulders of C. B. von Neel, whose ideas were based on a photosynthesis which was non or an oxynogenic. And in this case, his equation which was based on the sulfur bacteria where H2S was the source of, of uh, sulfur, we come back to his original equation transforming our own general equation now which says 6 molecules of carbon dioxide and 12 molecules of water. Empirically, we cannot cut this 12 molecules of water with 6 because the source of oxygen which is being released in photosynthesis is not the oxygen of carbon dioxide, but the oxygen of water. So, what happens to the oxygen of carbon dioxide? It also has 
um, incidentally 12 oxygens, 6 of which are consumed in the formation of the oxygen of the carbohydrates, that is the hexose sugars and the remaining ones would now contribute to the formation of water. So that means the carbohydrates are synthesized from both carbon dioxide as well as water, which again gives us a notion that to a, to a child we could say that plants are converters of carbon dioxide into oxygen, but I believe senso stricto it may not be very accurate. They are converters all right, but then the molecular oxygen which is being released is not being released from carbon dioxide, but from water. <clears throat> so therefore, the correct equation would now be of 12 molecules of water giving rise to 6 molecules of oxygen and imagine this, the formulation of this equation has taken a little over 2.5 centuries. <clears throat> Let us then come to the basic idea of photosynthetic pigments. We see plants which are of different colors, hues, shades and uh, during autumn we find in the temperate forest beautiful shades of orange, golden orange, yellow, brown. Now how does it all bring about? Are all these colors really useful for the process of photosynthesis? In other words, are these pigments contributing to uh, a photochemical reaction or is it also possible that there are some pigments which do not have a direct role in photosynthesis, but at the same time they are protecting the other pigments to do their job properly. So a photosynthetic pigment first should be located in some of the organelles. When we are talking about a green plant, then a cross section of a leaf for example would show a very, very complicated internal structure of mesophyll cells which would be further differentiated into palisade and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the palisade and the spongy parenchyma and there is a definite spatial orientation of all these tissues and within each of the individual cells there would be a few dozen granules which appear to be green. Well, not always so in all the plants, but a typical uh, leaf would have these green granules, the chloroplasts. So chloroplasts are green plastids which impart green color because of a particular pigment which we see subsequently. If we look at another 3D picture of the anatomy of a leaf, we find such a complicated packing of the different types of uh, mesophylls along with it, not to forget the conducting tissues of xylem and phloem because water has to come, minerals have to come and finally whatever is the photosynthate which has been formed has to be translocated and not to forget the gaseous exchange that is the intake of carbon dioxide and the release of molecular oxygen and everything and anything of this process is going to be modulated by uh, sunlight. If one looks at the structure of the chloroplast, it is a typical double membrane bounded organelle having two membranes and the inner matrix uh, which would be the stroma which has the aqueous fluid and which has all the ribosomes, its own genetic material and uh, the other ingredients. The internal membranes are so much amplified because it is a small area and lots and lots of reactions have to take place. So it is an ideal case of membrane amplification which would be analogous to the so-called mitochondrial Christi within the mitochondria. So as a result of this amplification, there are the stacks of thylakoids and each of the stack would be composed of different types of lamellae and they are together called as the grana, singular being grana. And they are all interconnected 
with each other. Looking at the chloroplast ultrastructure, a photograph through the transmission electron microscope, we can see a very organized array of the thylakoids which are arranged in the form of grana and of course there are other ingredients which are present within the double membrane bounded organelle. And uh, this particular ultrastructure is also having starch grains because ultimately the formation of sugars would lead to its polymerization into starch if there has to be no transportation. And if there, is, has, there has to be a translocation, then of course it would be in the form of sugars. Uh, as far as the early works regarding the photosynthetic pigments is concerned, uh, these are some of the works which are less cited in the books and we always start our story from Engelmann as we did on the last turn. But then these are some of the fine points. And one should not uh, forget the contribution of the Russian physiologist uh, Timirazev. He was the one uh, much earlier than Engelmann. He had established the fact that chlorophyll has a maximum absorption in the red ranges. So that means he was of the opinion that somehow it is the red light which is acting as a photosynthesizer for photosynthesis and uh, whatever happens next has to be with the help of the excitation of uh, chlorophyll within the red zone. Uh, one should also not forget that uh, a scientist by the name Sorit, he discovered a very intense absorption band in the blue region and uh, he also formed the, the porphyrin, we know porphyrins are the components of, of chlorophylls, we will see it uh, subsequently and whatever their derivatives are, they show a very intense band in the blue region and this particular band is of universal occurrence and in honor of Soret, we call it as the Soret's band. Uh, mind you, all these experiments were much earlier than Engelmann's famous experiments with uh, the bacteria which said that their, their accumulation was near the blue and the red ranges of the visible spectrum. <coughs> uh, a clear impetus to the study of photosynthetic pigment came from none other than the Russian scientist uh, Sweat, Mikhail Sweat who gave the technique of chromatography. The Greek word chroma means color and to write that means identification through colored. He was the one who making a column uh, of uh, the calcium carbonate, a glass column, he separated chlorophylls and the carotenoids. In fact, this is uh, one of the standard procedures which uh, children use in their schools and right up to the university level. This is one of the most standard procedures which is employed for the separation and, and the further characterization of, of pigments. Not only uh, the photosynthetic pigments, but the other non-photosynthetic pigments also. <coughs> and finally, it was left to the duo of Wilstetter and Stahl who actually elucidated the structure of the chlorophyll molecule and uh, Wilstetter uh, received a Nobel Prize in chemistry and they were the ones who uh, for the first time came to a conclusion that somehow their magnesium which is present in chlorophylls it is an essential part and nothing happens without magnesium and this particular molecule of chlorophyll has a definite relationship with hemoglobin. Now that is very interesting. We can draw a very important parallel between the two lifestyle patterns of plants as well as the animal kingdom. Let us first try to understand what are photoreceptors because in photosynthesis 
the the photoreceptors are the ones which are going to be the primary receivers of light so any pigment molecule which is capable of processing light and converting it into a utilizable form because merely uh, absorbing doesn't mean anything it has to process this light into a utilizable form so that the precursors for sugars can be formed and that can be a pigment which would have certain characteristic features in its structure the pigments that we see which are important for this job of photosynthesis are basically chromoproteins as the word suggests it would be a combination of a protein and a color imparting part the color imparting part is called as the chromophore which i have depicted with different colors that means it could function in the uh, within the spectra and it would have the apoprotein part which would be an integral part so if you separate them then it will be non functional so that means a proteins plus a chromophore would constitute a complete fully functional molecule which we call as the holochrome so a pigment needs to be in its holochrome form not necessarily all the pigments are proteins it's not uh, essential but then th this would be the basic idea however chlorophylls as we mentioned because in our earlier uh, lecture also i had mentioned that the the hero of the whole process is chlorophyll a so we are gradually getting to that and the chlorophylls are essential pigments that means they are the ones which are going to undertake the responsibility of the primary photochemical reaction but subsequently we would see that they can in spite of being a hero they cannot act all by themselves they cannot act alone and they would require the help of the other pigments which are called as the accessory pigments and these accessory pigments are in the form of carotenoids and the phycobilins now chlorophylls would exist in higher plants in lower plants maybe in a different form and then the phycobilins also would be present in in the lower forms and also in the uh, cyanobacteria the word chlorophyll itself is derived from chloros which means green and phyllon which means leaf again giving us a basic idea that the leaves are always green which may not be so we would see subsequently that the leaves may change their color and hue uh, depending upon the environmental conditions and of course uh, on the basis of the physiological status in which they are in however they are present in leaves and other plants uh, other parts of the plant so that means it is an implication if the stem is green if the leaves and other parts are green other than the leaves that means the trapping of light is is being exercised from those tissues also in addition to the leaves the chlorophyll molecular structure is uh, is very interesting basically chlorophyll is a chlorine molecule now what do we understand by a chlorine molecule actually magnesium occupies the center and there is a central ring and the chlorophyll itself is composed of two parts a porphyrin head and a phytol tail the head and a tail are just uh, the notional uh, diagrammatic representations which we give the porphyrin as such is composed of a tetra pyrrol a pyrrol itself as one can see on the screen is having four uh, carbons and a nitrogen and uh, this pyrrol is arranged uh, in in a manner that four of these pyrrols are arranged uh, on the sides of the magnesium and these are the four rings and in addition there is a fifth isopentanyl ring now this is unique to chlorophyll and it is not present in any of the other 
pigments which we wish to compare as we would do uh, in the near future. So, these particular rings uh, 1, 2 and 3, 4, there is a particular way of numbering them which is called as the Fisher numbering system and that means they would always be uh, named in a clockwise manner. So, 1, 2 and 3 and 4 rings and uh, this is the fifth or the isopentanyl carbon ring. Now, uh, these uh, particular pyrroles would have magnesium as the center. Attached to the number 7 carbon position of the ring number, porphyrin ring number 4 is a propionic acid residue. Now, this propionic acid residue is esterified and this forms a phytol chain. The phytol chain is about uh, C20H39. So, that means these are the two components of a chlorophyll molecule. Uh, there is a particular angle at which the, uh, the two components are spatially uh, related to each other. For example, the head is in the form of, of, a, of a tetrahedron, let us say, and uh, the, 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 there is an angle of 45 degrees. Uh, between the two, the head is has been measured uh, that is the porphyrin ring to be uh, 15 angstrom square and the tail is much longer, it is 20 uh, angstroms in length. Uh, both these components have different properties. For example, the porphyrin head is hydrophilic and act, this is the actual functional part because the electrons are loosely bound and uh, all the transitions and the redox reactions that is the oxidation redu reduction reactions which are taking place are going to be uh, controlled by this particular portion and it, it is this portion which is going to really contribute. Whereas, the phytol tail is hydrophobic and it is lipid soluble and uh, this is uh, composed of uh, basically 5 carbon isoprene units. You should remember isoprene units are the ones which also constitute the, the other pigments like the carotenes, uh, the, the plant growth hormone gibberellins and of course, the, the other hormones, the steroids. So, there would be a problem. In, in separating chlorophyll and putting it into a solution because uh, one of the components is hydrophilic and the other is hydrophobic. You must have learnt that uh, such type of situations we use the technique of saponification where the, 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 the tails are cut off from the uh, hydrophilic ends and then uh, the, the component is put into a solution. Talking of the structural relationships uh, between hemoglobin as was found much, much earlier, uh, not only hemoglobin, uh, chlorophyll seems to be structurally related to cytochromes also. As you know, cytochromes are electron carriers in uh, respiration, also in, uh, in oxidative and uh, oxidative phosphorylation and photophosphorylation. So, these particular components also share the structure as far as the porphyrin ring is concerned. But as one can see, even in case of cytochrome B, which I have taken as an example and also in the human blood hemoglobin, although there is a structure which seems to be quite common uh, that is the porphyrin head or the tetrapyrrole, but incidentally it is iron which is uh, the center of the hemoglobin molecule rather than magnesium. Iron being in cytochrome also in the electron carriers, but then another very important striking aspect one, one can uh, not miss is that there is no fifth non-pyrrole ring uh, which we had mentioned in case of hemoglobin. So, it is this fifth ring which is also giving unique properties to a chlorophyll molecule. <coughs> uh, chlorophyll also has unique properties of fluorescence and this was known much earlier 
that is if one takes a solution or uh, an extract of chlorophyll uh, in alcohol and uh, it would appear to be greenish or greenish blue in white light. But if the same uh, solution is seen in UV light, there is a rapid rise in fluorescence and this fluorescence would be red. And now we know that this fluorescence is due to the excitation of the photosystem 2 and then there would be a gradual decline. This phenomenon of induced fluorescence was uh, observed for the first time by uh, a scientist Kautsky and therefore we call it as the Kautsky effect. Now Kautsky effect may not be shown by all the photosynthetic pigments in a similar manner since uh, the uh, chlorophyll has a unique uh, property of uh, Kautsky effect. One can see fluorescence in vivo also and not through extracts. For example, if uh, a leaf of hydrilla or in this case a moss leaf because both of them would have a single layer of cells. So, there would not be much overlapping as far as the, the structure is concerned and under bright field uh, microscopy the, the chloroplasts are appearing to be brilliant green. But then when uh, given the excitation of UV light there is a brilliant red fluorescence which would mean that uh, this also is showing a Kautsky effect in vivo. <coughs> the idea of uh, fluorescence gives us uh, the unique system of how the leaves would be appearing in nature. Uh, maybe after a little break, we would uh, now dwell upon the detailed structure of the chlorophyll molecule. Here we were just drawing an analogy between hemoglobin or cytochromes, but then the actual properties uh, would await uh, the next part of our discourse. With this note, thank you so thank you so very much for giving us this session. Friends, you are requested to be with us as we are going to be back uh, very soon and would be discussing more. Till then, be with us, keep watching us. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on photosynthetic pigments and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Eklavi Chauhan. Dr. Eklavi Chauhan is a prolific professor. Through him we always get in depth knowledge on various topics of botany. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Eklavi Chauhan, do call us to our toll free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. 430. Dear friends, let us continue further as we have tried to give you maximum knowledge in our previous session too. Now, I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Klavi Chauhan once again and would request him to continue further. Hello sir, welcome back to the session. Thank you once again. Uh, friends, we are still uh, immersed fully in a detailed discussion on, on the structure of, of the so called hero of photosynthesis that is chlorophyll and chlorophylls are of different types chlorophyll A, B, C, D, E, F and many more and uh, we focus our attention only on two main uh, chlorophylls forms 
that is chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. These two chlorophylls are definitely different in structure, although slightly. They are solubility properties and also the wavelengths at which they absorb the light quanta. That means their absorption spectrum. For example, the main pigment happens to be chlorophyll A and chlorophyll A has a molecular weight of 893. All these informations have now been standardized and it has a, a molecular formula of C55H72O5 and 4Mg. I think every student of botany should, should remember this by heart and uh, we find we were talking about the pyrrole rings at the second ring there is a methyl group. Now, this is a very important aspect because this makes the chlorophyll A stand apart from chlorophyll B. Chlorophyll A appears to be green, it is soluble in ether and uh, it absorbs maximum in blue and red light and of course, it shows the, the solid band. However, our information has gone much farther. And our knowledge now tells us that there are different forms of chlorophyll A also. For example, there are chlorophyll A molecules which would absorb at 670 to 673 or 680 to 683 or 695 to 700. Now, that is going a bit far uh, as far as the red light is concerned. And then there are some special type of chlorophyll A molecules which are the P680 and P700. When we reach the actual mechanism of light reaction, these two are the ones which are the most important one because they constitute the photosystems or the primary reaction centers. Earlier, we used to call them as the light harvesting centers. So, these are the, the chlorophyll molecules of, of different types. But then, the fact remains that the basic property is that the there is a methyl portion at the number 2 and that is uh, number 2 ring and number 3 carbon position. In contrast, chlorophyll B has a molecular weight of 907 just by a minor whisker of the change in a group and the change is that in the second B of the pyrrol ring, instead of the methyl group, there is an aldehyde group. And just by this change, it has it is not the hero, it is an accessory pigment. And of course, by doing so, it would have say 2 uh, H more and 1 uh, of the oxygen, uh, 1 oxygen more and 2 H less. So, that means this change in property has, has made every change because although it is absorbing blue and red light, but then it appears yellowish green, its solubility also has changed, it is now more soluble in methanol. Chlorophyll B also can absorb uh, at different wavelengths, say for example, at 640 and 650, but nevertheless, it plays a second fiddle to chlorophyll A. And basically, like we have a dish, this is, is like an antenna and it is going to collect the uh, photons or the light quanta of different wavelengths and pass on to uh, the chlorophyll A for doing the basic job. Uh, this different uh, nature of chlorophyll, as one can see in this diagram, is on the second of the rings, we have a methyl and this is for chlorophyll A and the CHO which is uh, of chlorophyll B and that is making all the difference. Rest all the structural components are the same including the phytol tail. So, this has changed the property and one can separate these two chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B molecules on the basis of their solubility, on the basis of their RF values and uh, also the, the, uh, the different chromatographic techniques one can use. In this case, we have used paper chromatography and we find that the chlorophyll A has a higher RF value uh, as compared to chlorophyll B and their, their colors are also a bit different. 
uh, chlorophyll A being slightly uh, greenish blue and uh, chlorophyll B being yellowish green. <coughs> Even their uh, absorption spectra are different. Uh, for example, the chlorophyll A would show a maxima at say around 436-435 nanometers and there is a sleeve and a decline. So, this would be the, the green where there is absolutely no absorption because it, it is itself green and then chlorophyll A again shows a peak at about 670 to 680 uh, nanometers. So, that means this would be the solid band and then finally, this would be the red one. On the other hand, the, the band of uh, chlorophyll B seems to be more intense actually uh, because it is absorbing the light quanta uh, in the blue region around 480 nanometers and then again there is a sleeve but not so much and uh, then there is another peak at uh, s uh, around 650 which is much before. So, these two properties are also uh, making us argue as to then why is it that the chlorophyll B is, is playing fiddle, second fiddle to chlorophyll A. After all, it has also a stronger uh, absorption. The basic idea which we should understand and appreciate is that merely absorbing light quanta is not enough act at the same wavelength which we had seen on the last turn which means it is not only the absorption spectrum, it is the action spectrum also which is important and the two graphs should overlap. If they overlap more which would indicate the efficiency and in this case a chlorophyll A scores much better than chlorophyll B and hence uh, its acceptance as the universal pigment. Not acceptance by us, it is a matter of natural selection. So, it has been accepted by nature because the best is chosen. And then there are other chlorophylls also, chlorophyll C and chlorophyll D. Chlorophyll uh, C and D are present in, in uh, various forms of algae and in diatoms and their uh, peaks of absorption are also slightly different. So, till now our mindset has been that uh, we are playing under the red light and we do not think beyond red light and therefore, it never occurred to us although there are certain uh, bacteria which could uh, operate at wavelengths greater than 700, but then we group them as an oxygenogenic, they do not produce oxygen. However, uh, a very remarkable discovery which uh, I have put under the uh, heading of breaking news is that can photosynthesis occur beyond the red limit? It has been found or uh, the, the report has been published just this month only about a week back that there are certain cyanobacteria which if grown under the near infrared light somehow the chlorophyll, the standard chlorophyll containing systems will operate till uh, that red light and then they will be put off and instead another chlorophyll will, will take over and this is the chlorophyll F and this would bring about photosynthesis. Now, this is a remarkable discovery which has been done by, by scientists at the Imperial College London uh, led by uh, Professor William uh, Rutherford. And of course, they in collaboration with CERN and in various other groups and their paper is entitled Phytochemistry Beyond the Red Limit in Chlorophyll F Containing Photosystems. Why is it unique? Because now you have to think out of the red and here is a system which is a proper oxynogenic photosynthesis and that to occurring beyond the red light. Uh, for example, there is a colony of uh, the uh, clue cocodiopsis like cells and they are representing different colors because the, the magenta color here uh, represents chlorophyll A and the chlorophyll F is represented by uh, the yellow 
and we find that uh, this is a situation where we are going now more than 700 and maximum of the yellow dots are visible which exemplifies the fact that yes photosynthesis is possible. We have not given much importance to chlorophyll F in the past except that it is an accessory pigment but the uh, discovery has been made in uh, several beach rocks in Australia and uh, they find that chlorophyll F containing cyanobacteria uh, are growing deep into the rocks and uh, they can they can also uh, take up the job of photosynthesis as being the main pigment. Now what does the implication of uh, this whole business tell us? The point is that we have always set red light as the conventional limit for photosynthesis and we did not think beyond it. So with this discovery we have an idea that is it possible that the course of evolution has always been as we think it to be? Is it not possible that uh, the photosynthesis might have evolved say in a, in a different manner in some other planets, in some other solar systems where different types of light wavelengths were available? That is a point to ponder. And more importantly from the uh, apart from the uh, its evolution point of view is our current problem of the crisis of food. If this is so which is true then could we engineer taking the genes from such algae and try to engineer more efficient crops that could take advantage of the lower wavelengths because till now all the other wavelengths are going waste. We are always talking about the uh, about the the blue and the red, and of course the accessory pigments are taking uh, the the pigments uh, the the wavelengths in between. But then, what about the the wavelengths which are the longer ones? If they could be harnessed, maybe the 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 food problem could be uh, solved to a certain extent. And according to Professor Rutherford, there is a definite need to rewrite the textbooks after so many years that it is not only blue and red, it is the other wavelengths also. <coughs> then uh, we have the other chlorophylls which are the uh, bacteriochlorophylls. These are the principal pigments which are present in anoxenogenic bacteria. Now anoxenogenic bacteria are uh, a breed apart because as one can see they can absorb wavelengths at 705 to 1040 nanometers which we did not uh, think for a minute that they could also be done by uh, the cyanobacteria or oxygen producing plants or, although the example of chlorophyll F I had presented to you. There are different types of bacterial chlorophylls uh, ranging from uh, A, B, C, C, S till G. And out of these, bacteriochlorophyll A is the most abundant one. It has a molecular weight of 911, not much different from the usual chlorophylls. And with the formula 557406 and 4mg. So that means the basic structure is the same. If we try to compare, there are some differences. For example, the pyrrole rings 2 and 4 they seem to be reduced with H and the in place of the conventional vinyl group which is present here in chlorophyll at the uh, C2 position the uh, we find that there is an acetyl group. So these are the differences and the, the absorption also the absorption peaks would also be different. If one tries to compare now the structure of the three chlorophylls that I have just enumerated, uh, we find that the basic skeleton of these three pigments is common. However, with the variation of the CHO group being the characteristic one uh, of the chlorophyll B and of course the CH3 group in the chlorophyll A and here we find a different group. A, a, acetyl group in case of bacterial chlorophylls 
and in addition there is a saturated bond in the bacterial chlorophylls. The uh, bacterial chlorophylls also are distributed in different forms of bacteria. For example, heliobacteria, green bacteria, purple bacteria. I should point out that purple bacteria have, uh, have a pigment which is bacteriorhodopsin which is quite similar to the visual purple which we have uh, in our eyes. Again an analogy. <clears throat> How is this uh, pigment of chlorophyll synthesized? Imagine it is a very, very complicated process which is uh, involving more than 12, more than a dozen coordinated and regulated steps and it involves uh, more than 17 enzymes. It is a stepwise process. To cut the whole complicated process short, uh, glycine is the or the amino acid glycine is the starting point of the biosynthesis along with another molecule which is succinyl-CoA. You remember succinyl-CoA was an intermediate of uh, the Krebs cycle in respiration. The earlier textbooks mentioned that the precursor for chlorophyll is protochlorophyll. The concept has been modified to show that it is the protochlorophyllite which is present and this protochlorophyllite requires photoreduction. It means it would require a hydrogen source plus of course light and this would not function without these two ingredients and then it would give rise to chlorophyllite. Chlorophyllite being the immediate precursor of chlorophyll and this chlorophyllite uh, does not have a phytol tail. It has only the porphyrin. So, the phytol tail will be added uh, through the mediation of the enzyme chlorophyllase and as a result uh, either chlorophyll A and a common pathway for chlorophyll B and for that matter even for bacterial chlorophyll is seen. However, we find that there are certain plants that are growing in not complete darkness but very, very diffuse light and very poor light. Some gymnosperms, mosses, ferns which are present in the crevices of rocks as we say popularly have never seen the, the light of the day and yet if you just pluck them out and see they are, their leaves are much, much darker than the original sun growing plants. How do they manage with the synthesis of their chlorophyll? The discovery was made that in this case the protochlorophyllite does not need a photo reduction. It requires a reduction alright, but it does not require light and the function of this light can be done by an enzyme which would bypass the whole process and would give rise to chlorophyllite which also gives us an idea that perhaps the function of light in this process is to perhaps induce the formation of an enzyme which would be uh, catalyzing the process of, of the uh, chlorophyllite formation. Uh, a little uh, pathway, a biochemical pathway where glutamic acid is uh, being formed, uh, it forms a protoporphyrin. A protoporphyrin later acquires uh, magnesium ions uh, to make the skeleton complete and in the center and then it would give rise to protochlorophyllite. Protochlorophyllite would require NADPH2 as a hydrogen source and of course light to give rise to chlorophyllite A which would later acquire a phytol tail in the phase 4 to give rise to the fully functional uh, chlorophyll or chlorophyll A. <clears throat> it is not always that uh, chlorophyll A is synthesized. There are certain situations where the chlorophyll degradation is there. For example, just try to put a pot of uh, plant in, in darkness. It would lose its green color and it would turn yellow. Now, that would be etiolation. 
or if there is an infection or if there is a natural aging of the leaves. So basically chlorophyll breakdown would involve removal of the phytol by the enzyme chlorophyllase. Next the magnesium from the phytol, uh, the tetrapyrrole would also be removed by uh, decalatase and then ultimately the porphyrin structure is, is opened up. So that means this spatial arrangement is gone and this is mediated by the enzyme oxygenase and then once an open chain tetrapyrrole is formed, it becomes water soluble. Normally chlorophylls are not water soluble. Uh, there is an age old joke that if chlorophyll was water soluble, then a good amount of rain would have washed away the entire chlorophyll and they would have been bleached. But then that's that's a matter of satire. The, the basic idea is that one can make water soluble, uh, th this compound is water soluble by opening its, its tetrapyrrole and this we would see later. This is actually the case uh, in, uh, in the phycobilins or as we find in the environmental pollution today, the sulfur dioxide and various other species which are producing acidic conditions or acidification. In this case, as a result of uh, acidification, the uh, magnesium ion is dislodged from the chlorophyll molecule and the moment magnesium is dislodged, the, the whole molecule becomes non-green and a bit brownish and this is called as pheophytin and the process of uh, pheophytin formation is called pheophytinization. Another comment on the chlorophyll molecule and that is, is chlorophyll free, freely moving in a cell or in the chloroplast or is it really bound? Now, the, is there any advantage of being bound? So it has been found that uh, it is the phytol tail which was lipid soluble, it is going to resist towards the solubility in water and the spatial arrangement of uh, chlorophylls within the, uh, the, the grana membrane of the chloroplast itself are examples. So the chlorophyll is going to be located in the lipid domains and it is going to form non-covalent bonds. It is this spatial pattern which if were not there, then the light absorption would not have been that efficient. Plus, there are specified sites of pigments. So that means one knows where to transfer energy. If they were in a scattered form, then things would have been much, much uh, inefficient or less efficient than what they are now. So the presence of a specified site and chlorophyll in a bound form is, is imperative. <clears throat> the cl chlorophylls, in spite of uh, having all the accolades, are now subjected to a very, very vital question and that is, can the chlorophylls do it alone? If there were no pigments, would photosynthesis be possible? We have just seen uh, in the earlier slides that it is only basically the two regions which are being harnessed and that is uh, the blue and the red and with the latest discovery, okay, rarely far red ones. But then the other wavelengths are, are left absolutely waste. Plus, in spite of being the key player in photosynthesis, chlorophyll itself has so many handicaps. Number one, chlorophyll is very highly sensitive in a pure form to light. If it is exposed to light, it would photooxidize, and uh, in fact, it would be destroyed. This is called as photodestruction or photooxidation. Technically, it is called as solarization. So that means there are two problems which the machinery is facing now. Number one, protection and number two, support of any other accessory machinery which would somehow harness the 
wavelengths which are going waste. So, in order to complete these two prerequisites, the accessory pigments are really vital, which are going to perform precisely these two roles and that is the supportive role, they are going to absorb the light quantized wavelengths which are not covered by chlorophyll A and after absorbing the light quanta, they are going to transfer this energy to the main reaction center which of course is constituted by the chlorophylls and protective which means that they are going to protect this photosensitive chlorophyll against any photodynamic damage and if at all there is uh, the existence of reactive oxygen species, uh, these particular accessory pigments are going to be uh, helpful in quenching these species so that they do not assume dangerous proportions. The main uh, accessory pigments are the carotenoids and the phycobilins. The carotenoids are basically uh, terpenoids. As I said earlier, the isoprene units, the highly unsaturated isoprene units uh, are, are part of the isoprenoid pathway, the same pathway through which uh, gibberellic acid uh, and uh, abscisic acid are formed. And each molecule is uh, a C40 compound uh, molecule and it is a very long chain with conjugated double bonds between the two carbon atoms. And the characteristic feature of carotenoids is that there are two six carbon ionone rings which are present on both the ends. So, this is the, the, the basic uh, general structure of, uh, of carotenoids and uh, as far as the solubility is concerned, they are fat soluble, their, their color ranges from orange and yellow in color and they assume different colors in autumn because in autumn the chlorophyll degenerates and other brilliant colors are there. And uh, as far as their absorption maxima is concerned, they absorb blue and green light. They do not absorb red light because they, they emit red light and uh, they emit also orange light. So, that means uh, one must have seen uh, in, the, in the temperate forests such brilliant and beautiful hues of orange, yellow and red uh, in the autumn. It is a treat to watch the, the forest which can be other than green also. The carotenoids are of two types. They are of uh, carotenes and xanthophylls. Uh, the carotenes have a general formula of C40H56. Uh, Lycopene is the principal uh, which is red colored which is the principal uh, carotene and it is common knowledge. Roses of different colors, uh, tomatoes and red chilies, they all owe their uh, color and brilliance and glamour to the lycopene because that happens to be the principal pigment. Uh, all the other carotenes are isomeric forms of lycopene. They are in fact different uh, geometrical isomers and uh, beta carotene is the most abundant carotenoid and uh, um, one should not forget that beta carotene is a precursor of vitamin A. There, there was a uh, joke that we read right from our schools that the rabbits never wear glasses because they eat carrots in, in the field because they have enough retinol and here is a uh, pictorial uh, representation of all different types of fruits and vegetables that one can consume to have plant based vitamin A rather than getting capsules. So, the basic idea of, of the structure is again a C40 structure with the two ionine rings uh, on the sides. Uh, carotenes have an oxygen moiety also. <coughs> the xanthophylls are another type of uh, carotenoids. They have uh, again oxygen and uh, they, their color is orange to brown and the two principal uh, xanthophylls are lutein and fucoxanthin. Uh, one should remember fucoxanthin is the one which gives brown algae like fucus 
their color and beautiful colors of marigold and and other flowers is uh, due to lutein even poultry are given a large amount of marigold and lutein so that the the yolks of their eggs also are brilliant uh, yellow and they they, they fetch a uh, greater market value so these are some of the uh, distribution patterns of uh, the carotenes and the carotenols that is the xanthophylls their absorption patterns are different their uh, absorption uh, solubility in different solvents is also variable i think we would uh, uh, keep a discussion on phycobilins and the other uh, pigments for the for the next round uh, because there are lots of other uh, information to be shared thank you with this note thank you sir thank you so very much for giving us this session friends we are going to meet again very soon till then take care goodbye